Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for joining. My name is Leanne, and I am the Education Director at the People's Forum, which is a political education and revolutionary culture center based in New York City. I'm really excited for this very urgent conversation today, and I want to thank you all for joining. Um, everyone who's participating on Zoom or on YouTube, and especially to our wonderful group of speakers that we have with us today, Jody Evans, Tabita Chow, Sheila Zhao, Charles Shu, Molly Hurley, and Eric Sperling. Uh, so if you didn't know, this is the second in a two-part conversation on the escalating US-led aggression on China. Last week, we had a really great panel that helped us understand better the situation and sort through the disinformation that's characterizing the discourse around China coming from both major US political parties. Uh, we were joined by Danny Haifang, Kenneth Hammond, Tings Chak, Mikaela Erskog, Alice Slater, and Vijay Prashad, and Jody Evans, of course, and together uh, they gave us some much needed clarity. We heard comments on the history of the US uh, and China relations and US aggression on China. We heard about how media and political narratives help promote war and xenophobia and some of the alternative media projects like Dongfeng Collective and Tricontinental Institute for Social Research that are available to us. Um, we also address the false narrative that's aimed to delegitimize China's relationships on the African continent. And we heard very clearly what are the real uh, and urgent stakes in this issue. The risk and the consequences of hybrid or direct or even nuclear conflict cannot and war cannot be underestimated. And it was very clear after that discussion that there is an urgent need for a broad-based campaign for peace and against this US-led Cold War on China. Um, so no matter what anyone's opinion is on the intricacies of Chinese politics or US politics or economic policy or social policy, and wherever anyone identifies themselves within different leftist or progressive or anti-war spaces, it really is undeniable that any escalation will be and already is horrifically destructive for the international community and the international working class. And so if you didn't get a chance to watch that first part of this conversation, I encourage you to check it out. It is on our YouTube channel, People's Forum NYC, and I'll post those links uh, shortly in the Zoom and the YouTube chat. Um, so today we are here to pick up the conversation where we left off on this call for a broad-based campaign for peace. Uh, we're so lucky to have with us today an example of what this broad-based campaign might look like uh, with speakers who do incredibly important and urgent work in different sectors and with different approaches and orientations, but with a shared commitment to peace and an end to this Cold War. Uh, we will hear from each in turn, and then we will hopefully have some time for questions. If you are on the Zoom, you can submit any questions using the Q&A button on your screen. And if you're in YouTube, you can post them in the chat and we will collect them from there. So I would like to start by first giving a warm welcome to Jody Evans. Jody is the co-founder of Code Pink and the after-school writing program A26LA. She has been a visionary advocate for peace for 50 years. She's produced two books, Stop the Next War Now with Medea Benjamin and Twilight of Empire, Responses to Occupation with Viggo Mortensen. Also, uh, she produced uh, many documentaries, Shadow World and Most Dangerous Man in America are just a few of them. Welcome, Jody, and thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Leanne. Um, and thank you, Rita, for supporting us today. And thank you to the team of the People's Forum for hosting this important discussion. I can't think of a better place for it to happen. So yes, as um, Leanne said, you know, last week we we heard about the seriousness of the Cold War in China, but cold or hot, it's already a war. It's a hybrid war, and the first weapon has been sanctions, and underlying that is all the money that is being used to drive lies. They too are weapons. So, you know, we started Code Pink in response to the same pattern. Bush was frightening the American war and <clears throat> the American people uh, to support a war with his color-coded alerts, orange, red, and yellow. We called Code Pink for peace. But even after 20 million people marched in the streets across the world, we didn't stop that war. We have to learn the lessons from that. No matter how outrageous and wrong, this is for a million reasons, those in power 
Those who make money off of it don't care. Greed and imperialism are blind to the needs of human beings and the planet. The media works for those warmongers and will deliver their lies no matter how many times you correct the lies with facts. Congress will lose their minds and think that dropping bombs delivers peace. The war machine and weapons companies who were small then have more than tripled in size and they are co-opting everything. Women run four of the five major weapons companies, which has nothing to do with feminism. And now they are poaching on young black girls in STEM to bring them into the war machine. We used to stand outside high schools to protect students from army recruiters. It's become even more insidious. And the lies have been crafted to tug at hearts, to point the finger at China, even though, as VJ reminded us last week, there was not a Korean War. There was a US war on Korea. There was not a Vietnam War. There was a US war on Vietnam. And like with Russia, this is a Cold War driven by the US on another country. So, you know. They have what happens when someone's attacked? They have to close ranks, they have to spend money, they have to be more paranoid about their borders, and those around them and the society is squeezed. No way to treat anyone. The Korean people did not want to be attacked, the Vietnamese people, Vietnamese people did not want to be attacked, and the people in Iraq did not want to be attacked. I was there. I can tell you what it felt like being to be an Iraqi when the United States decided to drop shock and awe on them. A country that had just experienced a terrorist attack terrorized another country of 35 million people. I watched people shake. I watched what it feels like. We do not wanna do this. Um, we're already you know, crushing Iran with sanctions and Venezuela with sanctions and Cuba with sanctions. We know what that looks like and how devastating that is to human life. We also know this is not just about China, that like with the attack on Iraq, it destabilizes an entire region. So, you know, our mantra could pink is China is not our enemy. The US loves to divide and conquer. When I was in Iraq just after the invasion, I met the intelligence officer in Bremer's office. Bremer was essentially in charge of Iraq. Um, the intelligence officer made it clear that they were separating the country into Shiite, Sunni, Christian, and Kurd to divide and conquer. And they were partnering with Iran to keep the instability. The reason the US keeps troops in countries is to keep destabilizing. This gives them and the military contractors power and the capacity to pick your pockets for more money to make them rich. Today's panel is about how we engage now. First and foremost, we need a big tent. And I'm so grateful to the People's Forum and everyone here today to show that it, this is a concern of everyone alive on the planet and to all our different issues, no matter what our values and our interests and our commitments, we need to be directing it towards this Cold War. The, the big tent, you know, who isn't against imperialism, militarism, and war if you really break it down for them? We know it leads to nothing good, but the rich getting richer at the cost of people and planet, and all those that have any issue, that will be depleted or undermined if this path continues. Those of us who live in the belly of the beast, the largest terrorist organization on the planet that can wreak havoc far and wide and pay no consequences, we need to be engaged. The Democrat who was head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee when the vote to go to war in Iraq was before him said, yes, we must bomb Iraq to peace. He is now president of the United States and is bringing all those with him who were wrong. They have not been held responsible for over a million Muslim deaths they have not been held responsible for 4 million displaced um, refugees. Um, and they 
are again wanting to drive us to war and this time with China. Just last week, Biden bullied China by alleging they acted irresponsibly at the beginning of COVID, a lie that has been debunked by the head of the US CDC. But it continues to be a cheap talking point of the media and those in power. He also talks about sitting at the head of the table of the world. First of all, we feminists feel like it should always be a round table, but the hubris to think a country that is failing in all the markers that make a country healthy should be sitting at the head of a table is beyond problematic. The commitment to US hegemony must be stopped. Not to mention that you know, it spent 19 years destabilizing the Middle East and spending $5 trillion doing it. Um, while US streets are overflowing with those without a roof over their heads or food to eat. While China at the same time has lifted everyone out of extreme poverty. So we need to educate and mobilize. One of the things I learned in organizing against wars and for peace is that it's hard for people to have a relationship with war, to understand and engage with something that's so abstract and far away. Similar to what the climate change movement have seen, except those people that are really feeling the expense of it and young people who know it means their future, go you know, to some of the islands that are gonna be swallowed up by climate change. Every single person who lives there is engaged. So one of the things is how do we engage? What one of the first places that we can have effect is to rise up against the lies and hate. They create racism and xenophobia. And I'll let Sheila and Charles take that on later, but um, it code pink, we're using this as an opportunity to teach about what is happening by directing an action at Kamala Harris, the first Asian American vice president by calling on her to back down the Biden administration on their hate and lies. You can join that at codepink.org backslash Kamala. Last week, we delivered 5,000 signatures to her home in Brentwood, her apartment in Washington, DC. And through three close advisors of hers, we delivered it to her email. We are continuing to collect signatures and we will deliver a new batch every week until we see the Biden administration backing down. We must also get a foothold in Congress members who are willing to rise up on this important issue that understand the costs and the responsibility that Congress has. Their Congress right now, their attention needs to be on the need, uh, their attention has to be on the needs of the people, not more war. And I'll leave that to Eric and Toby who um, can take us deeper into that. But um, we do have to engage movements where a cold war in China will deeply affect their work. We need to be cooperating on healthcare and pandemics. We need to be cooperating on the climate crisis. We need to be learning about poverty alleviation and agricultural breakthroughs. So these movements need to be with us as we um, stop what would erode their work. But you know, we also have to remember that war militarizes our lives here in the United States. It militarizes our streets and will create more surveillance, more insecurity, which results in more militarization and controls within the US and more excuse to take away our civil liberties. We are currently crafting a letter to Biden on the environment for the environmental movement, calling on him to understand that what we need is cooperation, not war, and that China is not our enemy. Just this week, there was a really good example of how to engage. There's always things happening on Twitter and in the media where you just need to speak up and be a teacher. This week, it was Senator Marsha Blackburn who tweeted, China has a 5,000 year history of cheating and stealing. Some things never change. What a great place to just pile on some teaching. And it was great to see many of the folks on the panel here were, cl were climbing on, but we, we don't wanna let that go. Just check her out and give her some, uh, some of your own teaching and remind her that what she said is racism. Um, and uh, you know, it's a really great opportunity. Don't back down, keep piling on. There's a lot you can be learning and teaching while you go. We have to stand up to everything. 
everything they throw at us, we need to make a discussion. We need to create a moment of teaching. And so um, for the last few weeks at Code Pink, we've been trying to stop the appointment of Michelle Flournoy uh, to the Department of Defense. Here is a woman who was for the Iraq war, for the bombing of Syria, the bombing of Libya, and who's now urging uh, the Cold War on China. And she wants it to justify even greater military spending because she wants to spend a trillion dollars on new um, artificial intelligence, cyber warfare, and drones. But she was said that she wants to be able to bomb the entire China fleet. 300 military vessels, submarines, merchant ships within 72 hours. She spoke those words. Um, she wants more troop deployments in the South China Sea to conduct antagonistic roving war games. I mean, near two nuclear powers, um, China and North Korea, this is insanity. So we've launched a campaign to stop her and, and it's been one of the leading conversations around Biden's appointments and it needs to build. You can sign on at codepink.org, not her, and use the hashtag, not her, um, because this is a great opportunity to unmask US imperialism, the revolving doors between weapons manufacturers and the White House, which exposes the greed beyond, behind all these wars. Please join in. Uh, we're launching a letter from feminists that will be up tomorrow. So another important way to engage your communities and movements are understanding that this is not a Cold War like Russia. This is not a lie about weapons of mass destruction. These are two nuclear powers. And the US are the only ones who have dropped a nuclear bomb. And dropping just a few more would take us to a nuclear winter. And it would be the end of life on Earth. This is not a game we're playing. And I'll let Molly talk about this more later. Find an issue that is, you relates to you. Find the group you want to learn more with. Be engaged. The warmongers never sleep. What I learned from trying to stop the Iraq war is we need to want peace as much as they want war. They are driven by an addiction to power and money, and we by the love of life, each other, and the generous planet that supports our existence. All of the groups sharing on how to engage have ways that you could be engaged. Code Pink, we have we hold monthly women, weekly webinar, webinars on China is not our enemy. You can find them at codepink.org backslash China and keep up with the news from China. Check out the Dong Feng Collective. We must be engaged. There, this is where we can stop imperialism. It is going to take all of us. This is the most critical conflict of our time. If you do that, if you engaged with all your passion, those around you will pay attention and join with you. Thank you for all you do for peace. It happens in communities and it happens from our hearts. Thank you so much, Jody, for that great analysis and um, call to action and for all of the crucial work that you and Code Pink do and have been doing for peace every day. Um, that's many offerings for people to get engaged and stay mobilized and hopefully everyone can stay posted and, and participate. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Tobita Chow. Tobita is the director of Justice is Global, a special project of people's action to build a more just and sustainable global economy and defeat right-wing nationalism. His recent work focuses on countering the growth of xenophobia and anti-Asian racism by building US-China internationalism grounded in organizing Chinese and other Asian diasporas who are being directly impacted by these trends. Tobita, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Thank you, uh, and, and thanks to Jody for the overview and uh, for uh, inviting me to this event. And thanks everyone who's uh, uh, spending your um, uh, valuable Sunday weekend time with us here. Um, so, uh, the role that, um, that I've played at Justice is Global this year around uh, the US-China conflict is a lot of it is as a convener. Um, so convening a broad array of different groups uh, to talk about uh, analysis and, and strategy um, around this conflict. So uh, we work with like climate groups, uh, public health, economic justice, foreign policy, 
is groups that work on a, a wide range of issue areas, uh, trying to clarify how we all have, in, in different ways, a shared stake in stopping this conflict. Um, we also work with uh, Asian American community organizations and grassroots groups, and uh, that's the piece that I've been asked to uh, speak to um, uh, in particular uh, uh, today. So um, I want to start by talking a bit about my own stake in this work uh, from my perspective as a member of the Chinese diaspora here in the United States. Um, so. Long story short, this growing US-China conflict uh, puts me at risk. It's a threat to my future here in the United States. Uh, the more the United States, the US government, the US state sees China as an enemy, the more people in the US are going to see people of Chinese descent as an enemy. And this is going to impact not just people of Chinese descent, but uh, a lot of other Asians um, and uh, sometimes even indigenous people uh, who are going to suffer because the racists in this country just can't be bothered to tell us apart, right? Um, and we've already started to um, see this uh, this year uh, as uh, this conflict has escalated drastically under the COVID-19 crisis. Um, already in February, so very early on in the crisis, I witnessed my first um, anti-Asian hate crime in downtown Chicago, where a Chinese uh, American woman, just about like 10 feet uh, ahead of me, um, was confronted and assaulted and a complete stranger came up to her and just spat right into her face, um, which uh, was such an alarming thing to see so early in the crisis. Um, it's just such an, an act of just deep dehumanization. Um, since then, during the course of the year, um, others, I know other uh, Asian Americans in the US have been targeted with harassment, with assault. Um, there's been targeting both around blaming people for the pandemic. Um, people have also been uh, suspected of, of being spies. Um, and this is connected to the claims that the Chinese government is stealing technology from the United States um, that translate to, into just people thinking like any Chinese person around them might be a spy. Um, we've also seen a rise in racial profiling policies uh, from the US government targeting people uh, who come here from China. And uh, I think uh, perhaps other speakers will talk more concretely um, about, about that later on. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe uh, leave that for now. Um, but so we've seen this massive escalation this year. Um, we can anticipate that um, under a Biden administration, the trajectory of this stuff is going to change, but it's not going to fundamentally change. Uh, it's not going to end fundamentally this trajectory of growing conflict with China and anti-Chinese politics, um, unless we can build the power necessary in order to change it. But so that's my stake, uh, just about my own status here in the United States. Um, but there's also an international aspect to this. Um, I have friends and family across the Pacific. Um, so I have loved ones uh, in Asia who are threatened with being stuck in the middle of this conflict. And if it gets bad enough, they could end up getting hurt. Um, and you know, beyond the people that I know personally um, and care about personally, um, when I think about the violence of the US military getting used just against anyone who looks like me um, on the other side of the Pacific, uh, that's, that's very painful to think about. So whatever our background here uh, on this, uh, 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 at this event, like we all share a sense of horror when US state violence is used against anyone. But when it's, when it's targeting someone who looks like you, it just, it hits different and it carries a different personal meaning. So that's, that's, that's the perspective that I bring to this work. Um, but it's not just my perspective. Uh, so, like I said before, I've been working with a number of Chinese diaspora organizers and other Asian diaspora organizers uh, to build solidarity and to build power um, around this same perspective. Um, so, you know, this approach is, is not just to build power uh, around uh, countering this anti-China politics just within the Chinese diaspora, but uh, working across lines of ethnicity and, and nationality. Um, so um, this includes people from like Hong Kong, from Taiwan, from Korea, Vietnam, Philippines, uh, and, and so on. And I think like 
across these lines of ethnicity and nationality, we all have a shared stake in how rising uh, anti-China politics and sentiment is leading into increasing racism that impacts all of us here in the United States. Uh, we also have a shared stake in preventing escalating US-China conflict from threatening the well-being of people in all of our countries of origin. Because all, all a whole range of countries in Asia and really across the global south are at risk of getting caught in the middle of this US-China conflict. And as we saw in the 20th century Cold War, countries that get caught in the middle of a conflict between two great powers can be crushed. They can be crushed. They can be crushed economically, they can be crushed militarily, and millions of people can be made to suffer in the name of a conflict uh, between two other great powers um, that they have no power over. Um, so we need to work together to stop that. Um, so we are some of the people in the United States who have the clearest personal stake in stopping this new Cold War. Um, and that means that we have to lead uh, the movement against it. We have to lead this movement. We have to exercise leadership with the broader left. Um, and there are some challenges for us um, because given our place here in like white US society, um, we are always taught that our position in this society is to be a follower and not a leader. We're taught that our role is to be useful to the agenda of like some other person, probably a white person rather than like setting our own agenda. Um, and uh, we, need to, we need to step up and play a different role um, in the anti-war movement um, um, uh, in, in the years to come. So, um, you know, I wanna name that one consequence of this approach of, of building power across these lines of, you know, mainland Chinese, Hong Konger, Taiwanese, Vietnamese, and, and so on, is that we have to take seriously uh, the critiques that, that they have of the Chinese government, like from their perspectives. So as, as organizers in the US, our target is the US government, um, but they also have from their perspectives, critiques of the Chinese government. And, you know, obviously this can get very tense. Um, if you're familiar with some of these tensions, you can, you can imagine. So some of my comrades, for example, in the Taiwanese diaspora have taken me to task for some things I've said about Taiwan that didn't take seriously enough the legitimate concerns that people in Taiwan have about China and the Chinese military. Uh, this led to like very tense conversations. Um, and it was a struggle for me to like, like be fully open and not defensive in those conversations. But that tension turned out like very productive. Um, we came up, we came up with much stronger relationships, a sense that we have each other's backs. And I think that my politics uh, improved as a result of, of navigating those tensions and facing up to them directly. Um, and, and by grappling with that, we together we can build greater power and a sense of shared purpose across these lines of ethnicity and nationality. Um, because we have a shared sense that this increasing conflict between the US and China is going to make us more vulnerable here in the US. And it's also going to make people more vulnerable across the Pacific, people in mainland China, but also in Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, Korea, across Southeast Asia, all, all of these countries. Um, it will also, um, um, I believe, like make uh, oppressed people, uh, including Uyghurs and others in mainland China, more vulnerable. I think it just feeds into a nationalistic and authoritarian politics within the Chinese government. Um, so overall, the, the approach here is that whether you're, you know, um, whether you think the biggest threat uh, to you and or like people in your country of origin is nationalism and militarism, like within the US or, or within China, we have a shared stake in stopping this US-China conflict. And here in the US, that means exercising leadership to build a new anti-war movement. Um, so again, this can create tensions that are difficult to navigate, but um, in my experience, it also greatly increases the power that we're able to build by, uh, by entering into that space of tension and trying to create something constructive um, out of it. Um, I think it also increases our ability to build power um, um, beyond Asian diasporas. It gives us a different way to respond to critiques that um, I, I'm sure we've all encountered where if you, once you start talking about how uh, a US war with China would be disastrous, which is just obvious, um, people respond by uh, accusing you of, um, you know, throwing people from like Hong Kong, Taiwan and in Uyghurs and so on, like under the bus. And um, in my experience, coming from uh, a perspective of saying like, 
um, if you care about those issues, you also need to share with us the agenda of ending this US-China conflict, because that's only going to make everyone more vulnerable and put us all at greater risk. Um, that is, that's been um, a, a powerful uh, response uh, in my experience organizing around these issues. Um, so um, I think, so, you know, I've been talking about organizing within uh, specifically Asian diasporas. Um, I think there are ways that we could um, expand this that I'm interested interested in exploring. I think there are um, other diasporas from like other parts of the global south, um, particularly uh, Jody mentioned Africa and how Africa, many African countries are getting stuck in the middle of this US-China conflict. Um, I think there's a similar uh, approach to take uh, potentially with like leftists from, from African diasporas um, around like what's our shared stake as this like broader set of diasporas encountering the US-China conflict. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I'm also interested in exploring uh, the, the potential for organizing um, uh, leftists in, in the Uyghur diaspora um, who can share this analysis um, with us. And that gets at, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an exceptionally uh, tense issue when it comes to US -China, the, the, the US-China relationship and, um, and criticisms of China within US political discourse. Um, and I think there is some real potential there as well. Um, and again, beyond that, um, building solidarity um, across groups that work on different sets of issues like climate, like public health, like um, economic justice and so on. Um, we need to dig in and really make clear the stake that they have um, in this anti-war movement um, and building like a much, a much larger block of organizations that are united around this agenda, um, while also crucially increasing our own power. Like we need to build our own power um, as well while also building out these alliances. Um, so uh, that's the, the work that we've embarked on uh, this year uh, at Justice is Global. And um, uh, yeah, in it for the long haul, because this is going to be uh, the work of, of years, if not decades, um, and grateful to be in this with you all. Thank you so much, Tobita. It's so true. We have to be in it for the long haul and stay committed to this process um, and very much appreciate your words and the work that you're doing. Um, next, I would like to introduce Sheila Shao. Sheila is one of the co-founders of Pivot to Peace and has been building power in her community to stop the Cold War that's building towards China. Sheila is an institutional research analyst at Rio Hondo Community College in Southern California, and she's born and raised in San Francisco. Um, recently, Sheila facilitated a really brilliant panel for Pivot to Peace, uh, Chinese Americans United to, to Reject the New U.S. Cold War on China. I encourage you all to check it out. And Sheila, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Leanne. Um, and thank you again to the People's Forum um, for organizing this and all of the speakers on the panel today, as well as last weekend. Um, and I especially uh, wanna thank Jody and Tabita for setting up the stage for this. Um, again, my name is Sheila Shao, and I am an organizer and co-founder with Pivot to Peace. And um, I was born and raised in San Francisco to a Chinese immigrant family. And, uh, and I'm now speaking to you from Los Angeles. So I really like that Tobita set up the conversation by talking about what our stake is um, as people of Asian descent. Um, you know, this issue hits very close to home for myself, for my family, um, for the people that I've organized with. So I'm very thankful for this panel and teach in today. So now that we've kind of had a chance to hear from the experts from last week's teach in about China's development. A lot of uh, people don't know anything about China's development, China's role in Africa and so forth. I think it's quite important for us to discuss what we have to gain as Americans with, the, with peace and collaboration with China rather than confrontation um, and aggression. And really how do we build the movement around the shared goal and a shared point of unity? So the group that uh, formed Pivot to Peace began meeting basically early January of this year around this shared goal, right? We are a body made up of not only American peace activists who have been in this movement for decades, but also veterans, lawyers, judges, academics, and so forth who are just so deeply concerned about the rampant escalation 
in really the China bashing that we've seen over the past couple of years as a result of this really incredibly disturbing reorientation of US military um, foreign policy that deems China as an adversary. Um, and we know with the history that Jody laid out in the beginning, this ultimately leads to major power conflict if there isn't a significant grassroots force to stop it. And we've seen this reorientation impact the consciousness of everyday Americans in the US, that it has not only generated fear, but deep hatred against China and as a consequence, Chinese Americans and Asian American people, which we've already kind of talked about and heard about from the earlier speakers. And, you know, currently in, in mainstream media or politics, um, you know, in our view and pivot to peace, there really is just no room for any debate about China that is uh, fair or balanced, right? Much of what we hear in the media has a dominant narrative with a pro-war agenda, one that promotes the biases and distortions in which the bottom line conversation about China begins with the assumption that China is a great evil that the US is competing against. And many people really lack even the basic historic knowledge and understanding of China's past with colonial subjugation, as well as um, not just the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 in the US, but the many different anti-Asian policies along the way up until today. Um, you know, a lot of folks don't know that one of the worst mass lynchings in the US are, were mass lynchings of Chinese laborers here in Los Angeles. So, we in Pivot to Peace believe in fair and open communication of information about China, um, its economic, social, political affairs that's free from, from fear mongering, free from racism. And so um, I personally think that a unique aspect of Pivot to Peace's work is that we are very much dedicated to mobilizing both the Chinese American um, public and the non-Chinese American community. Many of our founding members are actually respected members of the Chinese American community um, and actually have a deep history in the civil rights movement um, of the 60s and the 70s, um, along with seasoned anti-war activists, as I mentioned earlier. We are a very diverse group of people. And while we can debate about US foreign policy on China, I think there needs to be um, a space in the anti-war movement, as Tabita mentioned, um, to uplift the voices of Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, people who, whose, whose lives are um, at stake because of this propaganda, particularly about how racism is a key driver of the anti-China campaign, uh, which has deeply impacted the psyche of Chinese Americans and Asian Americans alike. What does this new Cold War mean for the broader Chinese American community? You know, if you're Chinese or Asian American, you are not just simply contending with foreign policy, right? It's not a debate about China's policies versus US policy. We also have to worry about whether or not our children are gonna be bullied at school. You know, if our elders are gonna experience being verbally and physically assaulted. And, you know, I just have to say, you know, my parents who are immigrants live in San Francisco. My grandma who lives in San Francisco with my parents, I worry about their safety every day, you know? Um, whether or not they're going to be hate crimed. And we're constantly worried about, you know, as the atmosphere of hostility grows, how is this going to impact our family and friends? People do not even feel safe to go out. Um, so we, of course, have seen this exponential increase in hate crimes against Chinese and Asian Americans since the onset of COVID-19 um, and the scapegoating of China and Chinese people in the mainstream media and by US officials alike. And I just wanna mention here, like, you know, in January when COVID first was um, picking up wind in the media, um, anti-Chinese racism and, and just kind of um, the China bashing was so intense, but now we've seen, uh, you know, it has proven that COVID-19 was found much earlier in other nations and other countries around the world. But, the, but it's almost like we've forgotten about all the China bashing that happened in the beginning of this year. So, um, you know, 
in, in February of 2020, this year, actually before the lockdown, before the pandemic became a thing here in the US, um, some of the members in Pivot to Peace organized a rally in San Francisco's Chinatown where over 1,000 Chinese Americans came out to demand an end to this scapegoating. Some of the first people to actually uh, mobilize around this. And the slogans that they used were, fight the virus, not the people. For me personally, this was one of the most inspiring events um, of my activist life um, in my years of, of organizing in the anti-war space because I had never really had the opportunity to do this type of work within my own community, especially in the community I grew up in in San Francisco. And um, yeah, it, you know, I think that it's just this alone is important to note because it's these kinds of voices, these kinds of experiences that desperately need to be amplified into the mainstream and into the movement. And we must take a stand against US aggression and the human cost of these policies. I wanted to bring people's attention to a platform called Stop AAPI Hate that is already doing this kind of work. Um, this platform was developed by Chinese for Affirmative Actions, uh, San Francisco State University and Asia Pacific Policy and Planning Council, where people can now use this platform to report hate crimes against the AAPI community. Since its inception of March, 2020, um, more than 2,700, I think it's 2,800 now, hate crimes have been reported onto this tracker. Um, so if you haven't already, I highly encourage people to follow the work at Stop AAPI Hate, um, the website is stopaapihate.org. And they also have um, done some great reports and analysis of the data that they've gathered. Again, you know, racism is, is just part and parcel of the US war drive as we've seen in history's past, right? Again, I, I really wanted to echo the patterns that Jody outlined um, earlier in this uh, teaching about this country's devastating track record of weaponizing racism in this way. Uh, as Leon mentioned, Pivot to Peace held a webinar that was titled Chinese Americans United Against the Cold War, where many members of the esteemed, and many esteemed members of the Chinese American civil rights community came together to speak about just the souring of US-China relations and um, how it has deeply affected our community um, from a really great, historical narrative of anti-Chinese racist history, to Obama's pivot to peace strategy, to the impact um, of the first Cold War um, of McCarthyism. You know, one of the speakers spoke about how McCarthyism affected Chinese Americans during that time, which I think is often missing from the conversation about McCarthyism. Um, and also the the, uh, the webinar we had talked about the case for collaboration with China. Um, with the impending climate ca catastrophe, it's important that we collaborate with and work with countries that are making the pledge to preserve our planet and for the sake of humanity, right? Here in California, we are hitting yet another massive lockdown right in time for the holiday season, right? There is no identifiable solution in sight for the containment of this virus in the US. And every day, like it's just devastating to watch the news as we see record highs of deaths, record highs of cases. Um, so we really ought to learn from other countries such as China and also many other nations with far fewer resources uh, than the United States that have really dealt with this virus successfully. And so we need to push the American consciousness to look beyond the facade of racist scapegoating towards pros a prosperous future of collaboration for all humanity. Um, you know, I've often heard people say, well, what you are advocating for is all well and good. And yes, we agree that we should not be, um, you know, advocating for war uh, with China, but it shouldn't stop us from criticizing the Chinese government. And one of the speakers on our last webinar said, you know, he certainly disagrees with many policies uh, of the Chinese government. But then he asked the question, is this reason enough to justify war? Is this reason enough to foment such hatred among uh, the American populace? So we know that feeding into the propaganda machine is feeding into racism. Our place as peace loving people in America is to stop the war atrocities created by the US government 
as people, as Americans in the belly of the beast. That includes firmly opposing policies that directly fund or meddle into the affairs of other countries. We've seen the devastating effects of this over and over and over again, funded by our tax dollars that we did not agree to pay for. Um, and recently I saw a tweet that said that it only takes two to 3% of the US war budget to solve the COVID-19 crisis here at home. So shouldn't this be our priority along with working towards poverty alleviation, universal health care, and housing for all? So when we think about building a movement for peace, we not only need to understand the issue from a foreign policy perspective, but we must not forget that this affects human lives, right? What COVID-19 has exposed for us is that the the model minority myth, the, the lie, was always conditional for Asian Americans. We Chinese and Asian Amer Americans can never hide from our ethnic origin and will always feel like we have a target on our backs so long as this Cold War rhetoric and propaganda persists. Um, so how can people here get involved in this movement? Well, first, being in this teach-in is a great first step. And I encourage people to read and sign uh, Pivot to Pieces mission statement. We hold webinars on these types of issues and we get them all translated with Chinese captions so that we can really begin to uh, uh, mobilize and reach the Chinese American community to let the Chinese American community know that we do not need to live in fear because of the current conditions, but instead work together with the broader peace movement to fight back against this bigotry war and um, you know and aggression and there is a point of unity there for this to be a multinational movement um, this affects not only chinese americans but all americans so this is really the perspective of pivot to peace the type of work we do and again we encourage people to uh, follow our work at peacepivot.org thank you so much Thank you so much, Sheila, and for all the work that you are doing with Pivot to Peace and elsewhere. And I hope everyone follows and participates in everything that Sheila mentioned. Um, next, I would like to introduce Charles Xu. Charles is from the Chao Collective, a collective of diaspora Chinese challenging US aggression on China. They aim to equip the US anti-war movement with the tools and analysis to better combat the stoking of a new Cold War conflict with China. Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the People's Forum for organizing this event and by positioning ourselves as Chow Collective. As Leon mentioned, our website describes us as, quote, a diaspora Chinese media collective challenging US aggression on China. Um, in doing so, we have to remember that the People's Republic of China once was, within living memory, a North Star for much of the Western left. Since then, of course, the two have largely lost contact and gone separate ways. I think we really need to examine the reasons why and to heal this rift, especially with the new Cold War on China approaching at terrifying speed. After all, the US left played the decisive role in the domestic movement to end the Vietnam War, largely because its most radical elements identified so fully with the official enemy. So as for the diaspora Chinese part, um, both Tobita and Sheila have spoken to this um, very movingly, but Again, I want to reiterate, we in Chow Collective do belong to the Western left by virtue of our geography, our acculturation, and our involvement in local struggles ranging from tenant organizing to police abolition. But we and or our families hail from across mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Southeast Asia. And as such, we have a foot in both worlds and we're in a unique position to bridge that divide. Now, as for the media collective component, Hopefully all of us can agree that the relationship between the Chinese left and the Western left would be enriched by having all voices represented, especially those that usually get filtered out before reaching the other side. For example, in the West, we rarely hear from those on the Chinese left who broadly support the government, though not uncritically, who don't openly advocate for Western style capitalist democracy and who aren't some flavor of quote unquote dissident usually elevated by Western media. And we virtually never hear what original insights these people might have about American politics. This kind of intellectual gatekeeping is very counterproductive and harmful. So with our translations of writings by, for example, Tu Zhuxi on the US electoral politics, by Qi Liu on the George Floyd uprising, and by Zi Chu on the US pandemic response, all for a Chinese audience, we aim to start filling that gap. Conversely, 
the Chinese left uh, isn't as much in dialogue as it should be with the US revolutionary left. But many of us in Chao have thrown ourselves personally into the George Floyd uprising and into the ongoing movements for black liberation, for police and prison abolition, for indigenous sovereignty and decolonization. We have the immense honor of working alongside groups like Black Alliance for Peace, Red Nation and Anti-Conquista in a common front against US colonialism and white supremacy. We're especially indebted to our comrades at Red Nation for pointing out that the US military encirclement of China intensifies the colonial oppression of Hawaii, Guam, Okinawa, and many other Pacific Islander peoples. And much of our Chinese language social media presence is actually dedicated to bringing awareness of these shared struggles to a Chinese left audience. Honestly, we've been pleased to see these analyses picked up as talking points by high level officials as well. For example, Hua Chunyun, a spokeswoman for the Chinese Foreign Ministry now routinely drops zingers into her press conferences about police lynchings or the genocide of indigenous people in the United States. Uh, let's not be so quick to dismiss that as whataboutism. After all, that term originated during the Cold War to deflect criticism of the horrors of Jim Crow apartheid in the US South. So-called whataboutism from the Soviet Union, China, and other socialist states placed tremendous worldwide pressure on the US government to give in to many, though of course not all, demands of the civil rights movement. So in those, in those remarks, we really hear echoes of China's bold proletarian internationalism during the Mao era, which is really what bound it so tightly at the time with the most revolutionary elements of the Western left. We want to encourage a return to that internationalism among our Chinese comrades, yes, but even more importantly, among our Western comrades. We believe the Chinese left should once again see itself as part of a common struggle by the nations and peoples of the global South, the darker nations, as Vijay Prashad puts it, to free themselves from the shackles of neocolonialism. And we want as much of the Western left as possible to come over to that side of the struggle. That's why we're proud to work in such close collaboration with the Tricontinental Institute, and of course, the People's Forum and Code Pink. But bridging this divide between China and the US left and the broader anti-war movement remains very much an uphill battle. As materialists, we have to examine the real historical forces that led to this ideological parting of ways. So let's start with the basics. Uh, the mid to late seventies saw the end of the cultural revolution, the cementing of the Sino-Soviet split and a growing diplomatic rapprochement between China and the US. All of this led the United States to pursue uh, a strategy of so-called engagement, which in reality meant incorporating China into global capitalism as a large but peripheral and hyper exploited partner, weakening its bonds of solidarity with the rest of the global South and subordinating it to the geopolitical dictates of the US. That was the plan. China, on the other hand, entered this relationship with the intention of retaining full political sovereignty and strategically using Western investment to develop its own productive base. It may have started as the world's factory, quote unquote, but it's not content to remain there. Instead, it's moving rapidly up the value chain, it's eating into Western companies' share of the profits from Chinese labor, and it's challenging the US high-tech monopoly. China can thereby push for a truly multipolar world order from a position of security and strength. It lends immense material and diplomatic support to countries in the global south that are facing US economic strangulation and regime change, among them Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, and the DPRK. Much like the Soviet Union once did, but arguably with even greater resources at its disposal. And of course, just as it did with the Soviet Union, the US tries to spin these displays of South-South solidarity as a sinister plan for world domination. In this way, it seeks to project or rather displace its own crimes and social ills onto China as a hyper-capitalist imperialist power founded on racism and settler colonialism. Now, of course, our government is only doing this so nakedly now because the strategy of engagement manifestly failed from the US perspective. But perversely, it's the fact that that strategy appeared so long to succeed that alienated the Western left from China and conditioned it to see in China a reflection of America's own monstrous image. Uh, of course, as Tabita pointed out, on the domestic front, the US propaganda machine mostly works instead to position China as a great menacing oriental other. We've seen this during the pandemic in Trump's rhetoric about the China virus, in Biden's attempts at one-upmanship, uh, in a spasm of, of overt and often violent anti-Asian racism on the streets and at the state level in the racial profiling and persecution of Chinese academics and researchers. In this atmosphere, the specter of McCarthyism looms large. Uh, I worry, you know, we'll soon see a return to loyalty oaths, to professional blacklists, to the most rigorous thought policing to ensure that no one of Chinese descent 
can contradict the favor narratives of the State Department and remain in public life. And it's very concerning to us that many on the Western left seem intent on applying the same litmus test in our circles. So as anti-imperialists living in the imperial core, we in Chow do insist that our primary responsibility is to disrupt the US war machine and not to debate the social or economic character of countries that are in its crosshairs. But within left spaces specifically, we do also insist on the socialist direction of China's developmental path. A path that yes, is beset by many reversals and compromises, but in a deeply inhospitable world order, starting from a position of feudal poverty semi-colonial subjugation, foreign invasion, and civil war. In particular, as Marxists, we insist on treating socialism with Chinese characteristics, that oft derided phrase, as a process, a dialectical process rife with contradictions, but also replete with possibilities, not a static condition, much less one that China could somehow achieve a mere four decades in. Uh, as Jody mentioned, starting off, China just achieved a milestone in that process, the complete elimination of absolute poverty. A monumental achievement, 850 million people freed from abject want in just 40 years, and it went completely unheralded in the Western press. Just absolute crickets, and that includes most so-called left outlets. Now, we really believe that a media landscape that buries or ignores such stories, that limits itself exclusively to the discursive terrain set by our enemies, is an impoverished one. It's one on which the left and the anti-war movement are going to lose every time to a much more sophisticated and powerful propaganda apparatus. And it's one that's already cost countless lives, not just abroad by manufacturing consent for genocidal sanctions and regime change wars, but also here at home. The blood of COVID-19's many US victims is at least partly on the hands of media outlets, which in their orientalist arrogance, uniformly denigrated Chinese response and foreclosed the possibility of learning positive lessons from it. So to sum up, in spite of the pandemic, in spite of the trade war, in spite of nonstop US aggression on all fronts, China has met its 2020 deadline for ending extreme poverty. The next self-imposed deadline is 2049, the centenary of the Chinese revolution for becoming quote, a modern socialist country. Sure, that's a vaguely worded goal, but who among us does not want China to meet it in some way, shape or form? Who among us with any human decency would greet that prospect with anything but excitement? And who among us could do anything but work to the utmost to bring it to fruition? Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, it's really great to have you. I encourage everyone to please read carefully uh, Chow Collective's work on their website and platforms. There's some really incredible resources, reading lists, articles and analysis that have certainly helped me quite a bit in understanding the unfolding situation. Um, I would like to next introduce Molly Hurley. Molly is the Prospect Hills Foundation Inaugural Nuclear Program Fellow and a recipient of Rice University's Wagoner Fellowship. The Wagoner Fellowship provides funding for Molly's current work studying nuclear weapons issues, movement building, and the role of art in both areas. The fellowship also provides funding for Molly to travel to Hiroshima, Japan next year to continue her work. And in addition to her fellowships, Molly serves as a fellowship associate with grassroots organization Beyond the Bomb. In this role, she helps to foster the next generation of anti-nuclear activists by guiding them through the Beyond the Bomb seasonal fellowship program. Welcome, Molly. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so honored to be included on this panel. So thank you to all the organizers. Um, yeah, so I am going to discuss um, China and US relations and a little bit of China's nuclear history to help give us an understanding of China's US relations vis-a-vis -vis nuclear weapons. Um, and I do have a presentation, so one moment. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so first of all, I think it's important that we get a lay of the landscape, like what is even going on with nuclear weapons right now, because this is not a big topic of conversation since the end of the Cold War. Um, but basically, I'll give you a few highlights. Uh, between the US and Russia, they own uh, over 90% of all the world's nuclear weapons. Uh, the next arsenal with the largest amount of weapons is China's at around 300, 320 or so. Um, North Korea's is about 30 to 40, in case you're wondering what's going on with the DPRK. Um, and then France is close behind China with about 290. 
Um, just a brief history of China's nuclear program. China first got nuclear weapons in 1964. It was in October 1964 that they tested their very first nuclear weapon and they announced it and everything. And uh, Mao gave this great speech about it. Um, it took them about nine years to develop this nuclear weapon. They began development in 55. Um, and they had some interesting policies regarding nuclear weapons in the beginning. Um, in, the be in the very early years of their nuclear program, uh, China's stance towards proliferation was the idea of socialist proliferation, such that they could help other socialist countries develop their nuclear program. And I think an element of China's pursuit of nuclear weapons and their pride in success of this um, is the idea that they wanted to show other post-colonial countries that it is possible to catch up with, a, with the colonial superpowers. Um, um, early in the years also is when this really famous Mao quote came out in which Mao referred to nuclear weapons as a paper tiger. And this is often very confusing to Western, to Western thinkers of like, nuclear weapons are a weapon of mass destruction and yet he's calling them a paper tiger um that they're scared than they look but they actually have no bite and that's not necessarily what mao is going at we need a little bit more context to understand that um what's important to understand is that at the time uh the ideology of things was definitely paramount to everything else and so mao's reference to um it wasn't just nuclear weapons, it's uh, weapons and technology in general, but um, given China's history uh, and at the time their attempts to sort of catch up with the rest of their world and you know they're still attempting modernization and everything. Um, what Mao was really trying to emphasize is that it's the power of the people and proper politics and ideologies that is going to overcome hardships and it's you can't just blast your way through to success using nuclear weapons necessarily. Um, he saw them more as tools of political coercion as opposed to just these literal weapons of mass destruction. That's not necessarily China's stance or belief in the power of nuclear weapons right now, but in the early years, just to help contextualize that paper tiger quote, um, that's kind of where it was coming from. Uh, from the very beginning, China, like the day they announced, they announced that they were going to have a policy called no first use, which is a promise not to use nuclear weapons first in any sort of attack. Um, they also promised that they would not use a nuclear weapon on any uh, other state that does not have their own nuclear weapons. Um, so China is the only country that has always had this in their policy. India does they claim they have a no first use policy. Uh, it is China and India alone who have these policies. Um, China has always wanted a more multipolar world and they've always wanted um, more equality at the negotiating table. Um, in 1970, there was this uh, UN treaty called the non Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty or the NPT. China did not sign or ratify this in the beginning uh, because, and India and Pakistan have never signed it. And some of the beliefs for these other countries that have abstained from it is that the problem with the NPT is it creates a nuclear apartheid. Basically the NPT says that uh, the five established nuclear powers at that time, which was China, France, the UK, USSR, and um, the United States, could continue to maintain their nuclear arsenal so long as they made good faith promises to reduce their arsenals down to an eventual zero. And in return, all other countries in the world would not pursue nuclear weapons. Um, China saw this more as a great powers type of model of uh, and they wanted more multilateralism in it. Um, um, so they did eventually join the Committee on Disarmament, the CD, in 1980, because the CD was specifically created as a multilateral environment for these negotiations. Um, in 92, they signed the NPT. In 96, they signed the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, partially why they signed the NPT in 92 um, was, well, just kind of the way history went. Uh, it ended up that this was one of the only options to continue to maintain China's credibility on the world stage in terms of their commitment to nonproliferation and eventual disarmament. Um, but I think what's really significant is the fact that they signed the CTBT in 96. Uh, China developed its nuclear weapons uh, later than several of the other nuclear powers. Um, 
And obviously a really important part to development of a weapon is being able to test um, new programs or uh, weapons. Um, and yet in 96, China limited itself um, to no longer conducting any uh, nuclear tests. Um, and I think this really shows a commitment to uh, multilateralism and disarmament um, and uh, trying to show the world that they are want to be a responsible nuclear power uh, by taking on this limitation to their own arsenal uh, by signing and adhering to the CTBT. Um, in 1995, they released their first white papers, uh, which is just a formal document outlining their nuclear strategy. Um, the most recent white paper was released in 2019, um, in which, let me see, I took notes on this to make sure I said everything correctly. Um, okay, in which they call, they actually literally called it an open strategic challenge to the US, but one that does not have to lead to conflict. Um, it discusses their modernization and expands programs for their nuclear arsenal. Um, China is not alone in modernizing its nuclear arsenal. In fact, uh, France, the UK, US, and Russia are all also modernizing the nuclear arsenals. And yet people who kind of work on the nuclear side of US-China relations often like to quote China's modernization program as another reason to increase aggression towards China. Um, uh, and yet, I think, so this actually segues into some of the problems right now uh, between the US and China um, with regards to nuclear weapons. Um, so first of all, I wanna look at New START, which is a new strategic arms reduction treaty. It is a bilateral treaty between the US and Russia that is set to expire this coming February. Biden has promised he will extend it. He has, he's not president yet, so he hasn't actually done it yet, but hopefully he will um, because it is actually the very last remaining arms control, nuclear arms control treaty left between the US and Russia. If this ends, it does very much open up the door to a second Cold War um, buildup of nuclear weapons. Uh, the big holdup up until now, the reason Trump has not himself renewed it is because for a really long time, he was very adamant that there was not going to be any renewal of this treaty unless it became a trilateral deal between the US, Russia, and China. However, if we go back to my very first slide, where we're looking at the size of the nuclear arsenals. This would be an extremely asymmetrical agreement um, in which China's arsenal is about 1 20th the size of the US and Russia's. So of course, China was like, no way, we're not gonna even enter negotiations for this. Come back to us when your arsenal is is on par with our size, with the size of our arsenal. Um, and yet Pompeo likes to use this as an example of China being like problematic and uncooperative and everything. Um, at one point there was, um, uh, there were some meetings between the US and Russia to discuss New START and they invited China to it. China did not show up. And so then uh, they posted a tweet of the empty seats and they like photoshopped China's flags uh, in front of the empty seats, but they did the flag wrong. Like the stars were in the wrong position. And so whatever. Um, like I said earlier, also let's talk about no first use is that China has had a policy of no first use since the very beginning. The US is completely lacking in this. And of course, no first use is not a replacement for complete disarmament or elimination of nuclear weapons, but it's a really good responsible first step to de-escalate things and decrease the chance of some mistake or error leading to a nuclear war. Um, the There is a bill going through Congress or that's we're attempting to put through Congress right now, just the no first use bill. Um, that's what my organization Beyond the Bomb is working on. We are trying to get that through the US. Um, we're slowly building support for that. I do wanna point out a difference between the US's no first use and China's. However, China has the additional stipulation that they're not going to use nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear weapon state or in a nuclear weapon free zone. The US is simply, we're not gonna use a nuclear weapon first. So there's still, in my opinion, a slightly missing element um, to the US assurance of peace. Um, and then last is, this is definitely all about US hegemony, um, where um, we are becoming so aggressive towards China because China is challenging US hegemony. 
um, by going, by still having relations with Iran and um, by, and like our relations with Africa and how we don't necessarily charge interest on our loans the same way like the IMF does or something like that. And by we, I mean China. Um, as opposed to the US where we literally cooed Bolivia because they wanted to nationalize their lithium. Um, um, so the, and so this goes back to my point about the modernization of Chinese nuclear arsenal. Um, the US sees this as a threat. Well, the US is also modernizing their arsenal and this kind of goes to the hypocrisy of US hegemony as well. Um, we really, the US really likes to demonize uh, the DPRK, North Korea as well, for leaving the NPT in 2003 and then uh, establishing their own nuclear arsenal. But if we try to be a little bit more understanding about uh, why China feels like they should also modernize, why the DPRK feels like they need these nuclear weapons, is it's it is a matter of national security to these countries. Um, the US uh, loves to sort of force its way through things militarily, as we can see through the Middle East as well. Um, and after years and years of bullying the North North Korea, North Korea is like, okay, we, the US is probably going to try to overthrow us like literally any moment. So we need some mechanism of defense. And so they've established their nuclear weapons. And I'm not saying that I support North Korea having nuclear weapons, but I feel like there's a lack of understanding right now and how we approach uh, nuclear weapons uh, in the East. And there's a lot of Orientalism in how we approach this as well. Um, if we think about India and Pakistan, um, we're really worried about them, the conflict over Kashmir and everything. Uh, we like to characterize it as this like intractable conflict. Um, and it's like one of the biggest flashpoints of a nuclear war and whether or not that's true. Um, some of the beliefs behind that are very Orientalist in which we think that like just Indians and Pakistanis are so like zealous, these religious zealots and everything, and they can't be reasoned with because they are just like not Western white people. Um, and the same can be said about how we treat China sometimes too. How is like the characterization of people who actually like and support the CPC in China are just brainwashed. Like there's just the complete um, denial of any ability to like think for themselves or whatever. Um, but this is a really quick rundown of what's happening between the US and China with all of these things. Um, let's see here. I want to make sure that there wasn't anything else that I've left out. Um, yeah, um, this is this was a very condensed version. Uh, China's history with nuclear weapons has been much longer and there is a lot more there's a lot more thinking that's gone behind the development of China's relations with nuclear weapons, but the most consistent thing that China has always had is their commitment to a policy of no first use, um, which I think is really important. Um, if you want to learn any more or you have any questions, this is some of my contact information. In terms of what you can do, I really, uh, on the US side, I really recommend checking out Beyond the Bomb. We are, we have our ongoing campaign right now to promote no first use in the US and get that bill passed through Congress. It's going to be a really important first step. Um, and let's see here. That is all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Molly. That was really, really informative and really laid that out in a way that we can better understand. And uh, hope we, hopefully everyone has your is going to be able to follow and stay posted and, and engage in your work. Um, last but not least, I want to bring uh, up Eric Sperling. Eric is the Executive Director of Just Foreign Policy. He has worked as Senior Advisor and Counsel in the offices of Congressman Ro Khanna and Congressman John Conyers. He has a JD from Georgetown University Law Center and a BA from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Thanks so much for being here, Eric. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, it's very exciting to see this movement uh, growing. Um, as sad as it is that we uh, need to create a new movement to uh, uh, avoid a new escalation, new, new tensions, um, I think it's going to be a very uh, exciting um, and important few decades here as we build uh, and build broad coalitions to, to oppose um, any really scary conflict. I mean, I think, you know, China uh, is far more powerful than the Soviet Union was in the last Cold War. So it, it's very, very dangerous 
Um, so I'll just say a little bit about JFP, uh, Just Foreign Policy. We work on a wide range of issues uh, to promote diplomacy, impose interventionism, oppose it that the US does that uh, harms, often harms the people that well, we're trying to help. Um, you know, JFP doesn't take official position on underlying questions. It's not making assessments of uh, international human rights violations. Uh, you know, we have no doubt that you know, many of the governments that we oppose aggression against have made mistakes and have harmed people, have human rights violations. That's not our focus. Our focus is, um, is not relevant to our work. I grew up as a student in the Iraq war movement. Um, you know, and, and the fact that there were human rights violations in Iraq did not mean that war was a solution. In fact, it uh, ended up harming people. The same could be said of so many other countries. Um, so, you know, and I think when tensions are raised, it actually harms uh, the space for uh, people domestically who, who may want to pursue changes as people of that country rather than um, people coming from abroad. Um, so that's our focus as an America-based organization. What can Americans do uh, to make sure we're not causing additional harm abroad? Um, so as, I meant, as you mentioned, I have a staffer for a range of uh, anti-war members of Congress, uh, worked on a wide range of issues, uh, for example, starting on Yemen back in 2015. Uh, back then, uh, virtually no members of Congress had any awareness of the war um, or even paying attention. I remember our first effort had just two members of Congress who we're calling on the U.S. to evacuate its uh, its citizens from and from from Yemen due to the risk of the Saudi-led bombing that the U.S. was involved with. And you know, over time, we built you know after action after action. Each time, we were able to add more people and add more people to the efforts that we were doing, whether it was a letter or an amendment or uh, and eventually we built towards uh, these war powers resolutions that many of you might know about that actually had support from. Uh, progressives, the far right conservatives that people would say were are are horrible, and we agree on many other. Uh, we disagree on many things, but they were able to come together uh, for the good of um, uh, the Yemeni people in this case. So I think that's uh, kind of a model. Uh, you know, we're starting at that very early stage with U.S.-China relations right now um, in Congress. So uh, you know, there's nowhere to go but up, uh, is my belief. I think uh, I'd like to think that, and so. Um, you know, in, in Congress right now, there really is a total, basically a total consensus about this unclear uh, vision of getting tough on China, whether it's on trade or human rights violations or, you know, over the South China Sea. Um, you know, many of our favorite progressives have been leaders on so many of our uh, key issues, um, such as Palestine or Bolivia or, or beyond. You know, they haven't yet found a way to distinguish themselves in their rhetoric from those uh, like Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, who you know, I think most of us and most reasonable people know that those two are not uh, concerned about the well-being of the Chinese people. But unfortunately, uh, our progressive friends have not found a way really to distinguish themselves from that approach. Um, you know, one thing I say that usually is very uh, both humorous and sad, I say, if you think Ted Cruz you know, cares about uh, the Uyghurs, we just Google Ted Cruz Muslim. And the first thing comes up is him proposing all types of anti-Muslim far-right things. So the idea that these folks are concerned is, is, um, is not true. I do think some of the progressives uh, do believe they are reasonably concerned. And so we have to find them, uh, find ways for them to not be aligning with uh, hawks uh, who, who don't, uh, who, are, who are really saying this in a disingenuous way as part of a Cold War strategy. Um, you know, it's not going to be easy. Uh, I was actually lucky enough to go on a, a, a congressional uh, staff delegation of uh, cultural exchange in China. And I was actually even surprised by how closed off staffers were to hearing from Chinese people or fearing uh, everyone is, you know, the Chinese Communist Party. And, you know, so that they're very closed off, even knowing that someone has that bias, they still were not interested in hearing it, even factoring it in and saying, oh, I know they're biased. So, you know, we were actually on the high speed train from uh, Beijing to, to Shanghai. You know, I was the only one who was able to say, wow, this is really impressive development. This is very cool. People didn't even want to acknowledge a positive thing about China. So it gives you a sense of where staffers are at at this moment on this issue. Um, and so, so we have a long ways to go, but I think there's a lot of opportunities for progress uh, in Congress. You know, we have to be willing to work with people on all sides, coming at it from all directions, exploring every potential opportunity uh, to work with those who support cooperation. Um, 
Yeah, Toby and others have done fantastic work drawing these connections between Asian American anti anti Asian racism and the new Cold War. Um, you know, that gave us gave me a sense and gave me an idea to be able to work with the Congressional um, Asian and Pacific Islander Caucus on their um, hate crimes toolkit that they distributed to all members of Congress. And I was able to work with them and, and include language in there showing how the new Cold War endangers Asians, Asians and Asian Americans. And um, that was distributed to all members. And then the, the chair of, of KPAC, Judy Chu, uh, then did interviews, including working with the Quincy Institute, many of you may know, uh, denouncing the new Cold War and the way that it uh, will impact uh, her, the community that she represents. Um, so that's a sign. That's one example of a small step. Um, you know, I think this is kind of the process of looking for opportunities. You know, each person can look for, as they follow the news, you know, assess and look for opportunities to make these connections. Another example was, you know, a generally conservative anti-Iran hawk, Brad Sherman. Uh, we heard that he had unconventional views on uh, the South China Sea. Uh, he sees it as a, as a ploy for the defense industry to sell you know, new weapon systems in an era where a lot of uh, uh, you know, the war is now asymmetrical and not really conducive to huge weapon systems. So we were able to encourage him to lean into this. And as he ran for the chair of the House Foreign Affairs race and told him we would help get him progressive support for that position. And he leaned into it, gave interview after interview talking about how South China Sea mil militarization is a problem and is a military industrial complex uh, ploy. So that was an exciting win. And I think, um, you know, it was another example of a baby step and uh, opening up a little bit of space uh, for, for discussion on this issue. Um, you know, then we were able, you know, he loved the good press that he got. So we were able to convince him to, to lead a letter with other key people. Toby and People's Action was huge on this, um, calling for the U.S. to resume health cooperation with China. Um, Trump had uh, reversed an Obama policy and pulled uh, Americans out of uh, the Chinese uh, health ministry, where we had people working with them who would have had access to very early information, who could have relayed that back to the United States. Um, and, and therefore, we wouldn't have had this issue that we you know, didn't have access, because we would have had continued trust that the Obama administration and even the Bush administration had supported and built. Um, and so working with Toby and so many other groups, we were able to uh, get over 100 members of Congress. You know, this was you know, just working with constituents, you know, reaching out to offices. We got over 100 members. Uh, to call for a return to health cooperation with China. Um, so it seems like a very small, small step, uh, just uh, working on sharing information and skills on, on health, but it is actually the first major step that any member of Congress had done since the start of the new Cold War to, uh, to call for cooperation rather than increased confrontation. Um, so, and then we later shared this with the Biden team and they saw the huge number of people, of members that were on it. And they adopted that as their official policy. So it was like an early win where we have the Biden team for the first time that we saw uh, moving back in the direction of cooperation rather than, than confrontation. Um, so I think, you know, this is, you know, there'll be many other opportunities like this with different communities across the country, whether it's climate change, cooperating on climate change or global poverty eradication, um, you know, ending the risk of uh, conflicts of, of clashes accidentally uh, at, in, in the ocean or in the seas, like the, the incidents that, the unintended incidents that can spiral into a broader war and, and also in the air. Um, you know, and there's even gonna be opportunities to work with the business community who have built ties with China uh, and, and don't want those uh, ties to, to, to be eliminated. Um, this has been really effective in the Cuba space a lot of folks that have that want to create jobs in the U.S. by selling additional products. It's farmers. It's all types of businesses, and that's been a space that has been useful. And, and Cuba advocates are, are supportive of that, so that's a good model. So I think the question is, you know, what can you do to get involved uh, with these type of efforts? Um, you know, I think first and foremost, the key thing a lot of people don't do is get to know the congressional staff, both in the local office and uh, the foreign affairs staff are in D.C. Uh, one of the great things about uh, COVID for advocates is that you can be anywhere and do a Zoom call with the foreign affairs staffer in DC. So you could call their office, get the person's name. Uh, if you can't, they usually give it out uh, with the email. Or if not, you could reach out to CodePaint or any of our organizations. I'm sure we can, we can share the foreign affairs staffer with you. 
And then you're going to be doing this regular lobbying 101. We've heard so much about lobbying. Um, usually it's done for a negative purpose. Um, and often in many cases, you know, big pharma is a massive lobby, incredibly powerful and, and scary for a lot of staffers. Uh, APAC, massive lobby, you know, but we can use this for good as well. So you're going to be doing some of the tricks of the trade that lobbyists use. You're going to try to connect with that staffer on a, on a personal level, you know, you know, just get to know them. If they're from the district, you can bond over being from the district. And over time, they're going to know that you're the person that uh, they're going to hear from if their boss takes a vote that, or, or takes an action that's aggressive uh, against China and is escalating tension. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you'd be surprised how few constituents do this. Uh, you, you know, you'll be someone that they really know and are aware of. And, you know, it's something that all of our foreign policy movement can, can do. Um, and I think it's really, really important. And then, you know, I think it's really crucial too that regardless of what your views are on China, we have to be aware of where the staffers are and where members are in China. You know, you're not going to want to go in and start uh, praising, you know, the saying the Chinese revolution is a blessing for humankind and so on. I mean, you know, you have to know your audience, you know, target your message to your audience and, uh, you know, work people through kind of these key issues in the way that um, attention will harm Americans and harm uh, the Chinese people that many of these members want to protect. Um, and so then once you have these relationships, you know, as national groups like Code Pink uh, run amazing campaigns, you know, you'll be able to be activated. You'll be able to reach out to the staffer that you have already built this relationship with. Get that meeting, you know, bring in the information and, and hopefully get, get them onto uh, the next, uh, whatever the vehicle is that we're working on that's going to promote uh, better relations and, and healthier relations that don't, aren't going to harm uh, both parties. Um, so I think little by little, you know, we'll see that these movements, our people's move, our, our grassroots movement will create pressure that can counter the pressures that they're hearing. You know, they're getting classified intelligence briefings, you know, they're getting, uh, you know, visits from defense contractors, you know, and so our movement that we could create uh, through this process will be something that can offset uh, over time, offset as we build it, those, those movements. Um, so think that's at least the congressional outlook and I'm really looking forward to hopefully uh, building this movement and, and winning uh, peace between the U.S. and China. Thank you so much Eric. Uh, thank you for laying that all out and giving us so much information on the congressional front and thank you to everybody. This has been really incredible to have everyone in the same conversation and to see such a wealth of work towards a peaceful and a better world and an end to war and hybrid war um, and US-led conflict. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time. There's been many questions coming in from many different directions. And I think actually many of them have been answered throughout the contributions of different speakers. Um, and I think also they can continue to be answered by staying in touch with all the different speakers, um, following social media platforms, following all the websites that we've linked to, being engaged and uh, participating in these calls to action. I wanna ask Jody just for some final thoughts. There's one question that I think is really important to just touch on as we close. And that was from one individual asking, what do you do if you feel totally overwhelmed by the situation and no matter how many signatures you add, it's not going to do anything or if you feel pessimistic about uh, acting. So Jody, I don't know if you want to respond to that briefly before we close. Sure, sure. <clears throat> So the one thing we hope you feel after this is not overwhelmed, but that you have steps and that the, as Eric said, and so many have said um, that we've, we've begun something and the community is growing. As the community grows, the foundation that we stand on gets stronger. So um, the way the war machine works is to overwhelm you. So remember that that's their tool and throw it back at them and say, no, I'm not gonna be overwhelmed. I have a step. I have something I know I can do. Eric just told you, make a friend of your member of Congress. At Code Pink, we, we know that we, can, we get demoralized all the time. And so it's like, we have an action for you every week because action, the only recognizable feature of hope is action. And it is to be engaged. And that is what keeps you inspired and connected. 
you just heard from amazing people today that are engaged. They've given you tools, go to them, get engaged. It takes a community, be part of one of the organizations. Um, you know, all of us are having calls, we're doing webinars, there's places to have the conversation and to learn. Pull together your friends, learn with them together. Don't let this overwhelm you because that's, that's their plan and that's how they win. No, it's like one step at a time. And don't try to convince somebody way over there. Convince your friend. So who do you love that you care about that you don't want them to be used by the lies and the hate? That's where we start right now, in your communities, in your relationships. And the most important thing is not to let the overwhelm shut you down but to let the love and the, and your desire for peace open you up and find the next step and the next step and the next step. There are so many that were offered today. And I just wanna thank everyone um, for the diverse points of view and ways in. Um, please follow everybody. If you, if you don't know what to do, follow, you know, check on Twitter, follow one of these folks. They're taking on the lies every day um, and find an action that's listed on their sites. If you sign up with all of us, we'll be giving you things to do every week. The most important thing is this affects everything and we all need to be engaged. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Leanne and Charles and Molly and Sheila and Toby and Eric for all you do. And let's create peace. Thank you, Jody, for all you do. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you so Talk. much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a good